uh, the medical director at the Centre for Sustainable Healthcare. Um, and we're delighted to be hosting this webinar in, in partnership with the Health Foundation Q Community um, as an event um, as part of the Sustainable Healthcare Special Interest Group. So I'm delighted to welcome um, Dr. Kay Leadham Green, um, to, who's going to be helping facilitate today. Um, Kay is a colleague uh, based at Imperial College London Medical Education Research Unit, who's been working with us on this uh, on our project to embed sustainability into quality improvement education and training. Um, and Kay will in turn introduce our two um, panel speakers who have both experience of teaching in um, undergraduate and postgraduate health professions, QI education between them. Just to give you a little bit of background to the event, this is part of a series of four virtual events, um, which has been funded by the Health Foundation and NHS England and Improvement, um, aiming to increase collaboration in the field of sustainable healthcare. So the first event was focused on remote consultations and their role in sustainable healthcare. The second one looked in at green social prescribing. And then this is the third one. Um, we're looking in particular about embedding sustainability into healthcare education um, using sustainability and quality improvement. And the fourth event, which is on the 9th of June, will look at embedding sustainability into QI training and practice in healthcare delivery organisations. Um, so both this event and the next event are very, very much about learning from people who are involved in trying to do these things and reflecting on what they've um, learned and what they've encountered in that journey. And we hope very much that you will participate and have, um, ask questions and take part in the discussion on using the chat. Um, and a reminder about the Q community. This is a, a fantastic way of connecting with the broader QI community. Um, and within the Q community, there are lots of different special interest groups of which one is sustainable healthcare, um, SIG. And um, that's a really good space for meeting with other people who are working in this area and sharing resources. So as a very uh, brief introduction, I'm, I'm just gonna cover the key concepts of sustainability and quality improvement and a little bit of background about our project. Then we're going to go on to um, the panel discussion, hearing from where it's been used in teaching. Um, and then another colleague is going to um, share some of the learning from the evaluation that we've been doing. Um, and, um, and then there'll be further opportunity for discussion. So what is sustainability in quality improvement? Well, one thing um, we really want to make clear is that we're not trying to create a new thing. We are trying to integrate sustainability into healthcare improvement methodology um, and make sure that um, we align the goals of improving quality with improving sustainability of healthcare and we make use of the whole range of tools and resources in the QI approach. Um, and at the center of SUSQI, as we call it, is the concept of sustainable value. So what we're trying to do is uh, achieve the best possible health outcomes for patients and populations that we care for, um, and to minimize environmental, social, and financial harms or costs. So we're taking a concept of value and that's very well understood, trying to maximize good out outcomes over costs. But we're just paying more attention to the nature of the costs and that we're not just counting financial costs in that, but the full range of environmental, social and financial resources that we're using and impacts that we can be having. Um, we've deliberately kept the framework quite flexible so that it can fit with lots of different QI approaches um, because they all have these steps in common, which are that we set, need to set goals. And so we need to align those goals with sustainable value. We need to study the system and um, how as it works at the moment before trying to change it. Um, and part of studying the system is to understand the environmental and social impacts that our system is currently having and how we might um, look at improving that. Um, we always need to design some improvements to test 
and in SUSQI, we use the sustainability principles, prevention, patient empowerment, lean pathways and low carbon alternatives to help us to generate improvement ideas that will um, achieve the greatest benefit. And finally, when we come to measure the impact of our project, we go back to our original aim and we look at how we have impacted on the health outcomes for both the patients and populations and on the environmental, social and financial costs. And so as again, we make use of all the different QI tools at our disposal. And I guess the, the real one of the real benefits that we're finding is that um, by bringing together these two um, approaches and ways of thinking, we're helping people to move from just understanding that there's a problem around sustainability in healthcare and that something needs to be done and, and starting to equip people with the tools and the skills to be able to make a change. And just to give a flavour of the sort of um, projects that we see coming through, um, we, you do see some projects that have been specifically initiated in order to try and reduce the carbon footprint, but you can also bring a sustainability um, perspective onto any other project, QI project, and make sure that you're tackling in environmental and social factors at the same time. And so these are some of the examples of projects that have that we've worked with teams um, to capture and write up. Um, so that's about sustainability in quality improvement in general and the main, and the concepts that underpin it. Um, and then we've been lucky to have um, a, a grant funded programme supported by the Health Foundation and Health Education England with King's College London over the past two and a half years. Um, um, we've called that the Sustainability and QI Education Project. And this is the team and um, you'll meet today um, Dr. Victoria Stanford, our education fellow, who's going to present some of the findings from the research that, that's been part of the project, and also Dr. Kay Leedon Green, who's going to facilitate our panel session. And we've also got um, other members of the team, including um, our QI education lead, Siobhan Parsley Williams, who's not here today, and also um, past fellows, there's Dr. Rosie Spooner and also um, Dr. Uh, Stuart Dutch Smith, who was the first fellow. Um, so the objectives of the project have been to demonstrate that sustainability can be practically included in, in QI training, um, to evaluate the impact of that on um, people's motivation for and skills for QI, um, and then to, to support the spread of successful approaches. Um, We've worked with uh, 14 different um, sites uh, across a range of undergraduate and postgraduate uh, health professions education um, and in both medical education and also nursing and allied health professions. Um, so we've, in each case, we've worked them to integrate sustainability into um, the QI training that they already provide or are about to introduce. Um, rather than um, looking at this as, an, as a sort of extra. So our, we've been aiming to integrate with, with core teaching or existing teaching. We've recently um, just published this uh, multi-centre evaluation of uh, the impact of that on, on their attitudes and, um, and on the way on, uh, that um, uh, learners view sustainability and QI. Um, and their confidence and skills for um, making change in the workplace. Um, and um, Victoria is going to present some more detail on the findings from that later on. I'm sure it will also come up in the panel discussion. Um, we're now uh, very much focused on the spread phase um, and we're using, our, our, again, we'll, you'll hear a little bit more about this towards the end of the session and how you might want to get involved with your institution. Um, but we are um, giving recognition to beacon sites, which are a growing number of beacon sites um, around the UK and potentially further afield um, that are um, already integrating this into training. And that could be both um, universities, but also um, QI departments in, in trusts and health boards or 
um, postgraduate training programs. So I'm going to um, stop sharing now. Um, and I'd like to introduce um, Kay Leadham Green, who's been our wonderful collaborator. Uh, she's a researcher, she's a GP by background and a medical educationalist um, and a researcher based at the Medical Education Research Unit at Imperial College London. Um, Kay, can I hand over to you? Thank you very much, Francis. So um, we've two short presentations covering different health professional contexts, followed by a panel discussion. And do post questions as they arise into the chat. And we'll make sure they're addressed in the Q&A. But I'll start by introducing Dr. Heather Bade, who's a registered nurse with a background in critical care. Uh, Heather's a principal lecturer and multi-award winning educator and researcher at the University of Brighton, where she's introduced sustainability through quality improvement into a range of courses. Her PhD explored sustainability within intensive care, and she's working nationally on the Green ICU project. Heather is also the driving force behind the SHARE conference on sustainable healthcare, academic research and practice. So perhaps if Heather, you go ahead and I'll introduce you Florence in a moment. Great, thank you um, Kay for the introduction. And I have shared these slides with the CSH. Um, if anybody wants to have a copy of them afterwards, you're very welcome. And it's got my contact details there as well. So um, thank you for this opportunity. It's been fantastic collaborating with the CSH on a number of different projects over the years. And when this SUSQI framework came out, it really was such good timing. Because I think for many of us in education, we've been doing things um, such as we might call it the Goldilocks principle of trying to encourage students to think about not too much and not too little, but just right amount of healthcare at the right time. And we were you know, quite familiar with the concept of quality and these sort of traditional domains of quality in healthcare. But as a, a lecturer in the university, teaching intensive care nurses, which is my main role, um, this SUSQI framework really has just brought all of that together and allows you as an educator to just use that sustainability lens on some of the things that we were doing already, but enhance it even further, particularly around environmental sustainability and social sustainability aspects of um, ethical sides of um, resources and where resources come from. So I've been teaching the intensive care nursing course at the University of Brighton since 2007, but I also teach on a, a variety of other modules, um, mainly the sustainability session now, that's all I tend to have time for. And uh, from a practical point of view, as an educator, I just found it just gave that scaffolding to be able to, you know, have these ideas that you have, but it, there's so many resources um, within the SUSQI website and the original publications that Francis and others have, have produced that as an educator just gives you a starting point to, to look at whatever topic you're teaching that day. And it really does fit into any, any topic, but it's more about changing a mindset of you know, whatever we're doing. In my case, it's intensive care mainly, whatever the clinical topic is that day, how can we encourage um, students to be learning in a way where it's um, efficient, effective, equity, et cetera, all those domains, um, as well as sustainable. So we've been integrating it into the intensive care nursing course for some time. As I said, I've integrated into leadership modules within the MSc courses and MSc advanced clinical practice courses for advanced practitioner, which works really well because these are very senior clinicians in practice who are very often leading on quality improvement projects. And so some of these students are now using the SUSQI framework within their dissertations and, and integrating academic work with their trust-based work that's part of postgraduate um, studies. Just to note, um, I was asked today to speak on postgraduate education, which was my main remit within the university, but my colleagues in the BSc nursing course, and I know other um, healthcare courses are now um, starting to use the SUSQI framework as well. And I think the other thing I wanted to emphasize today is how much we're using it within assignments, because I think we've been teaching it for some time. And then I started thinking about well, what about assessments? If we're teaching us sustainability and we're valuing it as important and we're putting it in our learning outcomes, well, how are we assessing that sustainability? And the SUSQI framework also gives a really structured approach to integrating um, this concept of sustainability, whether it's an essay, a post presentation, an audit assignment that postgraduate students might be doing. And it's been um, something that's been really helpful, particularly in the intensive care nursing modules that um, I helped to lead on. Just drawing from my PhD research, which was a qualitative study interviewing people who work in intensive care, exploring this concept of, of sustainability and what it means to them. And um, this um, 
idea of satisficing was a way that I packaged up how to explain the, the concepts that were coming out. And satisficing is a, a term and a, a concept that comes from business, which essentially means that you're satisfied, you know, you're reaching that satisfaction that you've reached a goal, but you're sufficing with the resources that you have. So applied to healthcare, I've highlighted quality care there because all of us, you know, ultimately want to reach quality care. And if we're doing education, we don't want to be thinking about sustainability as in cutting back resources that's then at the expense of not just patient quality care, but also, you know, in this day and age of the pandemic ongoing, you know, staff well-being is still such an important um, piece of the puzzle and the SUSQI framework for me really brings that holistic view on environmental sustainability, financial, social, clinical outcomes and underpinning all of that um, behavior change essentially with, within staff being able to achieve that quality care and postgraduate education then being for whatever field you're in, in my case intensive care nursing, how intensive care nurses are graduating from courses with this understanding of um, quality care and really underpinned by the principle of stewardship. And prior to getting into all the sustainability stuff, the only time I ever remembered this word stewardship being used was with antimicrobial resistant stewardship programs. But what I found in my teaching is in using that Susquehanna framework, I find it just slips in all the time now. The other day I was teaching on inotropic drugs or you know it could be fluid therapy, it could be anything you know, back to that Goldilocks principle of the right amount of resources, but also not wasting. And I think the SUSQI framework um, in the student projects I've noticed over the last few years, they're looking broader now and it really enhances their thinking around where do resources come from? Rather than just thinking they come from the shelf, I use it, I put it in a bin and that's my job, but thinking broader than that, how are resources procured? What's my role as a clinician, in my case, a nurse using that? What is possible to be reused, recovered, recycled, it's not always possible. And when we're doing the waste management, how is that done in a sustainable way? In the intensive care community, it feels like we've got a long ways to go into getting a, a truly circular economy going. But in using the SUSQI framework within education, it feels like a start and it feels like it's encouraging postgraduate students to be thinking broader than just at the bed space and you know what's the meaning of that work that you do with the bed space but within the bigger picture of resourcing from that whole you know where do the resources come from to using them to the the end um, aspect of that resource cycle and if you have students that you're encouraging to publish or you think about publishing your own QI projects, you may find that journals typically will require a particular criteria for, you know, the kind of publication that you're putting in. I'm sure many of you will be familiar with, you know, typical um, requirements that journals would request or that the reviewers are using while they're peer reviewing. And if you're publishing a quality improvement article, the standard is to have um, what's called the Squire framework as criteria. And the Squire framework provides an outline of a, um, you know, planning and publishing a, a quality improvement project. And there's a section in the middle of it called the rationale section. And what the Squire encourages you to do is to think about what are the frameworks, the models, the concepts, the theories that are informing that quality improvement project to make it more robust. And in the academic assignment that um, we get the students to do, we really encourage them to use the SUSQI model, which is integrated with those principles that Francis was just talking about around prevention, health promotion, lean pathways and sustainable alternatives. And so just as a, as a tip that if you're um, not familiar with the Squire framework, or if you are familiar with it in that rationale section, that's a really a, um, great opportunity to list and to justify not just what you're doing, but how you're going about it and the theories that drive that project. And both SUSQI and that CSH model of clinical practice that's integrated in um, work very well there. I also find from the student point of view, it just gives them a starting point. So sometimes students, you know, or we all love that, we've got these great ideas, you kind of instinctively know what you want to do, but just trying to figure out, well, how do you go about that? So both the SUSQI and the Squire, it gives them a starting point, there's templates, it gives them that scaffolding is what I call it, and then they can plug in what their clinical topic is, what their interventions are going to be, how they're going to alter that to demonstrate that they've been effective. And the, um, the templates in the Squire, um, or the SUSQI website, providing that QI process of plan, do, study, act is, is all built in there for them. 
And just to finish up to say that we're about to launch um, a postgraduate module. And just to share that instead of, um, I mean, obviously we're putting sustainability in everything that we do, but if we're hearing from students that they would like more. And so we're about to launch a postgraduate module will be offered at both level six for anybody doing a BSc or level seven for anybody doing a master's or postgraduate certificate, um, or it could be just taken as a standalone module. And we're gonna do a classroom version as well as an online version. And the SESQI has been really instrumental in planning the curriculum and planning the um, module outline. And the plan is to use um, a, a SESQI based assignment as the assignment for that um, university based module as well. So these are some of the examples and some of the, um, the journey that I've been on in using the SESQI leading to um, a, full, a full module with this. And I look forward to the question, the comments and the further discussions today. And thank you very much for this opportunity to speak on it today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Heather. Um, so without more ado, uh, do keep your questions coming into the chat and we will address them during the, the Q&A. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Florence Wedmore, who is a core medical trainee and a medical education fellow at Bart's Health NHS Trust, where she's chair of the Trust Staff Sustainability Network. Florence has a master's and a brilliant future in public health and has been working to embed sustainability through quality improvement into undergraduate medical education at Bart's and the London School of Medicine and Dentistry. Over to you, Florence. Hi, sorry. Um, thank you for that introduction. Um, so I'm talking a little bit about uh, kind of the other end from where Heather was talking about with the postgraduates. Um, with a colleague of mine, Anna Moore, we've been teaching students right at the beginning of their, their um, journey into kind of being a healthcare professional. So first and second year medical students um, through a student selected component that we set up in uh, December 2020. So we've run four cohorts of students now. Um, and so this is a student selected component. They get two weeks of kind of intense time with, with Anna and I and invited speakers. Um, and we've run it online with 10 students each time. And we take them through, so and um, we start off with, you know, why climate crisis is a health crisis and some of the environmental impacts of healthcare, um, and then move on quickly to talking about some of the solutions. So talking about social prescribing, talking about the health code benefits of um, climate change um, mitigation, um, talking about nature and health and, and the interconnected of those. Um, and then we teach them about quality improvement as a concept, because um, these are really early medical students who haven't got very, very little clinical exposure. So teaching them, you know, how healthcare isn't perfect and, and how uh, quality improvement is a sort of framework um, that we can make changes in hospital. And through all of that, we're then integrating the principles of sustainable quality improvement at the same time. So they're le learning them really as one. Um, and then the main sort of outcome of, of, the, of the two weeks is that they um, come up with a quality improvement, a sustainable quality improvement idea themselves um, and present it at the end of the two weeks. So we kind of give them a bit of background. We set them some kind of clinical problems where they can start with, but and they get ideas from the speakers we get in, but sometimes they come up with their own ideas, which are brilliant. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about those in a second. Um, and we kind of coach them through developing that as a project idea. Um, thinking through how it might actually be feasibly implemented at the end of it. Um, and along the way, we think that they are learning sustainable quality improvement, but they're learning a lot more as well. So there's a really kind of integrated, um, it integrates with many different parts of their curriculum. So there's a real focus on the social determinants of health, that sort of social part of the triple bottom line, um, learning about empowering them as students that their ideas have have validity and, and that you know that they can kind of bring a creative approach in um, and and we've seen that you know at the end of it where they've gone off and done things like so some of them have been involved in the planetary health report card they've written opinion pieces for the bmj they've started to look about how they can implement some of these projects um, which is really impressive for, for again you know, really early medical students some of the ideas that they came up with are some sort of particular um, examples that i thought um, that stood out for me over the four cohorts of students we've had going through now. Um, so this is one of my um, favourites was actually one of the recent ones. So this was a um, these pair of students decided to look at um, food waste um, as, a, as a, kind of a problem within healthcare um, and obviously a, a kind of sustainability problem really closely linked. Um, and this was brought about by one of them who, um, as part of her work experience, had volunteered on a ward um, with the domestic staff. So she was um, very much integrated in the housekeeping staff and was able to see this, you know, so much of what we give patients is, is 
end up in the bin. Um, and she said, you know, this seems a lot of it is because it's just like, so unappetizing. Um, and then went around and did some amazing, found some amazing research that shows that um, if you improve how you present food on, on the plate, then you, you reduce the amount um, people, it stimulates people's appetites. So less food going in the bin, but also actually reducing um, length of stay in hospital at the same time. So a kind of double uh, sustainability impact in terms of you know, less food going in the bin, but also f fewer bed days. Um, and then really impressively thought through a lot of the practicalities of, of how this might actually be implemented, you know, who you would need to train up, um, how you might kind of give the, the um, housekeeping staff a guide of, of how to better present food on plates and so on. Um, so that was one particular example. Another one, again, a quite a recent example that was um, particularly stood out. Again, these students just went to, a, to amazing lengths and came up with an idea that, that that I hadn't thought of before, which was they just noticed that when, when we're washing our hands in hospital, the kind of WHO hand washing technique has a long time when you're washing your hands, you're scrubbing them and the water is running and you're not using it. Um, and they did some home experiments and showed that if you use your elbow to turn on and off the tap in between, then you, you can reduce the amount of water that's used to wash your hands. And thought about how this again is a kind of global impact. Um, if this WHO hand washing technique is, is going to places where um, there's real water scarcity um, and, and sort through kind of again you really thought through actually how they would implement this in terms of how you would educate staff and um, even how you would alter the posters without having to present to print out new posters. Um, another an early example was was um, some students um, we talked about the kind of environmental impacts of inhalers um, but they took away you know a lot of people come and think okay well let's do an inhaler switching project um, but they took away some of that, those principles of sustainable health care and thought, actually, why don't we look at prevention first as, and, and how can we get more people who are representing with asthma um, and, inhale, and um, frequent exacerbations into social prescribing to help with their preferences rather and you know, helping them with other techniques to improve their preferences rather than always reaching to the inhaler. Um, so again, the, their projects showing how they've kind of taken in, in those, all of those concepts that, that we taught them through the two weeks. Um, and a final one just to talk about was, um, again, quite a simple idea that of just, you know, that anybody could see that often there's a lot of wasted electricity in, in healthcare. Um, and they looked at a project that previously been done in our trust called Operation TLC, which had um, massively reduced at the time um, electricity wastage and, and energy use, but kind of critiqued how that, that had dropped off um, and again came up with a plan and, and made some beautiful graphics. Um, shown here about you know, how we might um, trigger people to, to start thinking about um, turning off lights and um, reducing uh, energy wastage. Um, so, just stop so I think overall, yeah, our, our kind of experience shows that um, by teaching this really, really early on in the curriculum, you get this real um, imagination that sometimes may not happen um, later on in terms of the ideas that they brought but also hopefully that they are now viewing that lens, that kind of transformational learning that once you start to know this stuff, that, that will um, change how they see things throughout the rest of their, their time at medical school and hopefully um, will be something that they can continue into practice. Um, so thank you again for this opportunity to speak and um, yeah, look forward to some questions. Thank you so much, Florence. So um, moving straight forward again into our panel discussion. Um, I've got three core questions for you, and then we will go ahead and, and pose all the questions that are, are coming through in the chat. Um, but firstly, um, perhaps if I can go back to you, Heather, um, what do you find that has really worked uh, and what hasn't worked so well and why, um, both in terms of um, educating people to do SUSQI and actually in your SUSQI practice? Well, what, what do you feel are the sort of critical success factors and perhaps some of the challenges? Well, I think um, if I start with the challenges and that sort of helps to think about overcoming them, I think like um, Francis, you said a comment earlier about emphasizing not adding something in, but enhancing processes that are happening already, or just looking at actually, we all need to think about sustainability in everything that we do, you know, in any sector in life, you know, when you consider the climate crisis um, extent. So in raising 
whether that's with students or fellow colleagues, something that's different. I think that, you know, there's always challenges around people's capacity, especially now. And um, I'm sure everybody's busy, but, you know, the intensive care community during the pandemic, we're all still, you know, just struggling to get through the day. So if you come at, whether it's students or colleagues or their mentors supporting them in practice, something different, it's it's catching people in a way that is engaging and that is motivating and that actually makes sense to them. Because um, I found, you know, sometimes for some people, if everybody's logged onto the call today, I'm assuming you're interested in environmental sustainability, but not everybody is. Or some people are really interested in it, but it seems so scary. It's so big. There's almost an eco anxiety about it. So, what I actually, going back to what works well, is what I quite like about the SUSQI is it gives things in manageable chunks. And it could be bite size, it could be something that's quite small as an hour long session, it could be something that applies to a whole course, or, for example, the postgraduate module that I've just applied. So I think it allows you as an educator to use that flexibility. It also allows you to use language that people understand. So another challenge is for some people thinking like, well, actually, that's not my job. Isn't sustainability for estates or I'm here to nurse the patient today. That's my job. That's what I identify with. Um, and for some people, the word sustainability might be wrapped up into, you know, more strategic political sustainability things, which means your local hospital's closing down because that's part of a sustainability transformation plan or sustainability is something that other people do. And actually, that means using less for more, you know, you're going to give me less money, but you want me to do more. That really came out as one of the themes in my PhD research around, you know, lean thinking and stuff. For some people, it puts them off because it just feels like, or lean thinking, oh, does that mean that actually it's poor quality care because you're going to give me less money? But if you use the language of quality improvement, who doesn't want to improve quality for their patient? And a lot of clinicians aren't necessarily driven by financial drivers, but everybody wants their patients to do better. And so if the project becomes, for example, um, Francis, you shared uh, an ICU example about an early mobility project. Um, you know, so if, if, the, if you call it quality improvement, it's a QI project, we're getting patients up out of bed faster, they get off a ventilator faster, they get home faster. Well, that's really engaging. That is, you know, for an ICU nurse, that's, you know, very motivating. If you essentially did the same interventions, but you called it sustainability and you used metrics that people don't understand and use language that people don't understand, the intervention of the project can be entirely the same. But I think what the SUSQI gives you is that language and um, something that fits within the culture and within systems that are already in place. And um, very often people have to do audits within their work environment um, for their own promotion as part of their jobs. And so, you know, if it's tied into this PDSI cycle anyways, it's tied into quality and proof process that are already there. For me, that's been um, a really positive aspect that's helped to overcome some of those barriers and challenges. So really important points there around um, how sort of capacity, we don't have capacity to do more. We don't want to be doing more productivity and the way the SUSQI actually enables people to see better healthcare in ways that are slightly less resource intensive and often easier. So that's that's a really helpful bit of learning. Thank you, Heather. Um, I just had one uh, yes, quick add-on to that, which is essentially saying the same thing, but putting a little bit of an IC slant on it, is that a lot of this is just about what I would call good housekeeping. Mm -hmm. So sustainable practice in whatever field you're in, whether it's primary care, intensive care, um, public health, you, you know, the things that we all know we should be doing. So and preventing resources from being used in the first place. So those those really important fundamentals of getting people up out of bed, the minimal sedation possible. I've seen somebody's put in there about, you know, say uh, about huddles, um, which we often do the sort of the shift. So it can be part of what we're doing already. So we do it more efficient, which then gives you more resources to do other things. So actually, ultimately, it should release resources um if if it works yeah reducing wasted activity why not yeah. yeah so florence what are your sort of um challenges and strategies that you found both in education and in practice for introducing this um so i guess some of the the challenges is that is also some of the good things that, that came out of this so we were teaching a very small cohort of students who'd, who'd chosen this um so we, you know out of each year we were 10 20 students um, of a year of kind of 350 at, at Queen Mary, um, which it was good in that, that we got, you know, this very engaged group of students who, who really got this and, and were 
you know, most of them kind of came with some kind of environmental concern and then we were able to give them an outlet for this. But I guess the, the problem and the challenge of that is that we were only reaching a very small cohort out, out of, um, you know, that, of that group. Um, and the challenge is kind of how do you start to think about how this could have been implemented um, on that kind of much, much larger scale of kind of you know, 300 plus years of, of medical students um, while still getting that same engagement. Mm -hmm. um, and then I guess the other challenge is, is, again, teaching it so early was was they didn't really have much of a, you know, their lack of clinical exposure meant that they didn't have much of a framework to hang this on. I've given some examples where they have kind of overcome that from, from the experience that they have, but sometimes getting them to think of things that were feasible. And then what we would really have liked then is to, to kind of start to translate mm -hmm. into real projects. Um, and we were hampered a little bit by a few factors. I mean, we started this during COVID, so it was very difficult to, to get them onto the wards and you know, there wasn't really the capacity for anyone to be making, to be doing kind of interesting quality improvement projects a lot during COVID. Um, and, and that kind of, because they were so early, sometimes getting them to come up with a feasible project that, that could be, we could kind of hit, link them up with people um, was a challenge um, and, and something that, that you know, we'd probably need to work with the medical school a bit more to, to kind of think, you know, again, a two week SSC is tricky to, to implement anything in that time. And, and, to, and it would be a bigger curriculum change to think about how it could be implemented more kind of longitudinally. Um, mm. So really important points there that perhaps we can um, pull out in our Q&A, thinking about how to mainstream this from an SSE up into core teaching. And this sort of idea about this lack of agency for early learners and how you create agency and opportunities to actually do projects on the wards, which is another really important um, challenge. Thank you, Florence. So um, how, how are we doing for our question? Oh, sorry, we've got um, one other main uh, facilitator question, haven't we? Um, what are your next steps for SUSQI um, education and practice? Where, where would you like, what's your vision? Where would you like us to be taking this next? Again, yeah. I was going to say, should I go for that one? Um, one thing that our um, sustainability special interests group um, has just started doing, so this is all it has started, but we're um, in terms of that question, it's, it's the first thing that comes to mind for me. Um, so this special interest group is a, um, a cross collaboration group of staff and students within our School of Sport and Health Sciences. So some nurses, but also there's OTs, physios, and we liaise very much with our local medical school, which is the Brighton and Sussex Medical School. And what we were finding is we were doing some really fantastic stuff like in our teaching, integrating SUSQI into our assessments. Some of you um, may have just attended our SHARE conference that we co-host with the Centre for Stable Healthcare. And um, I'll put a save the date at the end, but next year. And can I just do a little plug? If anybody's doing some QI projects or your students are doing QI projects, please come and share them at the share next year, which will be May online. Um, but then we, I was in this clinical skills rooms one day. So this is a simulation room where students are learning. Uh, you know, every medical school, nursing school, you know, will have rooms where you're practicing things. And I thought, oh, goodness me, like we're not leading by example here, are we? Here we are teaching it, we're assessing it. So one of our next steps is actually we're using SUSQI ourselves. So we're using the framework of the SUSQI as a special interest group to plan our own quality improvement project to get our own housekeeping in order. And so we're at the early days of it. And next week we have two nursing students who are gonna come on placements to us. So anybody involved in nursing placements, think about that. You can get placements within your own simulation areas. And we're getting the students to experience SUSQI within um, this greening up clinical skills project essentially and using the SUSQI methodology to um, to embed those principles of, of quality improvement but in the way that we demonstrate teach and within OSCE or clinical exams because what we're finding is there's just huge amounts of opportunity for um, uh, preventing waste within our own environment plus financial costs we spend so much money uh, because so much ends up in the sharp spins we're incinerating ridiculous amounts of packaging and pens and coffee cups and things like that in the university environment but what are the students learning as well they're learning bad practices in our simulation rooms so we i think all anybody involved in universities we all have a role in leading by examples in exemplifying what we're doing so that that's our own sustainability as an institution because all universities have to demonstrate the same sustainability metrics now um, 
but also that students are experiencing SUSQI while they're um, in their um, clinical skills teaching and things. And so that's a, it's just, just starting off, um, but um, that's kind of where we're going in, in using it locally here at the University of Brighton. Fantastic. And Florence, perhaps some of your vision for the future for education. For yeah, I, I mean, I think it comes back to the point we were just making at the end, it would be about integrating it into you know, reaching a wider audience than, than perhaps your, your very engaged students. You know, maybe leaving that opportunity there to have that kind of intense time for, for those engaged students um, and to get what they out, get out of it, but, but working out how it can be integrated. And, we've, and that's the one thing that all of the students say at the end of this, they, they, of our SSC. You almost unanimously come out and say this should be taught to everybody and um, you know this needs to be integrated into into all practice and and there is a kind of project um you know i think with kind of pushed by many different factors in, into working out how we can in, integrate more sustainability into um healthcare education um and anna and i will be pushing for that to to include an element of quality improvement sustainable quality improvement in there so that it's not just sort of you know, as we've talked about before, not just talking about the problem, but also giving those solutions. Um, I unfortunately am taking a step away from doing an education role next year, um, and teaching the SSC is going to be one of the really sad things I'm going to really miss um, there. Um, but hopefully, uh, um, there will be other people who who will be you know, able to take it on and, and kind of develop it further. So, the, what's it, so QI methodology being able to su su sustain <laughs> and and spread exactly. your teaching, fantastic, and, and, and thinking about how this works um, across a, a, as, as a core component. And I quite liked your theme around um, students that sort of get it, they sort of develop this, you just can't see it in, medicine in any other way. Once, once yeah, it and, it, and I think it's a very different you know, from what Heather's just saying then about, you know, having to almost hide it um, or, you know, because people are so overwhelmed once you get into a clinical role that, that thinking about something extra can feel a lot. This, we get kind of the opposite that, you know, the, these students, they really, this is something they really care about and they're not seeing reflected in their education. So actually, you know, this is, this is something they're looking for specifically and, and we're you know, giving them an outlet for, for that concern and, um, and showing them that there is something that can be done about it. So there's I'll a hunger for this type of education. Go ahead, yes. I was going to say, I'll find the, the publication. I don't know if anybody else has trouble talking and searching and pasting all the same time. So I'll add it in the chat in a minute when I finish talking. But the University of Brighton was part of an international research project where they surveyed a number of different nursing and I think midwifery students as well. And it was a repeat from a previous study in 2014, just basically scoping out, you know, what do students want? In academia, there's nothing more powerful than the student voice. In healthcare, you know, when you think of the service user perspective, it's about, you know, integrating that service user voice. And so hearing from students and they're hungry for this. They don't understand why we're even asking the question. Like, of course, climate crisis is a public health crisis, of course. You know, so um, if there's a, a recent publication about this, I can post if, if people are looking for a, a reference to justify or to, to seek out some funding. And, and also just to comment on, we are also integrating into our postgraduate education course. So this would be a course for, um, any healthcare educator, but I'm sure people have similar things where it's a, a qualification. And so that's another avenue of ensuring that, you know, for almost like train the trainer, the educators of the future are going off and, and having the sustainability lens. And that's very much um, a session that's and, and sort of perspective that's integrated into our PG cert education course as well. So that's really helpful, Heather, having um, leveraging the student voice to help get it in to core teaching. And of course, the Planetary Health Report card, I think both TASME prizes went to um, projects, I think one from Brighton, where they were leveraging the Planetary Health Report card as a way to increase the student voice and the student voice is hungry for this. Thank you. So um, perhaps, uh, Victoria, uh, if we could um, open up to some of the questions from uh, our audience and perhaps if we can open up our, our panel, perhaps to include Francis and uh, Rachel, if you'd like to, to address any of the questions as they rise, together with uh, Heather and Florence. Yeah, brilliant. So we've had some fantastic questions and engagement on the chat and already some networking with people linking up doing similar SUSQI projects or having a similar idea. So that's really fantastic to see. Um, I'm just scrolling up my screen to see where we're going to start. So we had a question about 
opportunities for getting into education. So Katrina says, I'd like to get involved with teaching med students, SUSQI, uh, in, in the same way that Florence and Anna have done, but have no formal education qualifications. As a GP of 25 years, I'm deeply involved in greener practice, who do I approach at medical school? So that's quite a practical uh, question. Do we have any responses from the panel? Sorry, someone's just turned the lot. <laughs> That's what, what I, I used to do a bit of a lot of GP education, and I can tell you now, if you are a GP that would like to teach, any medical school would be delighted to have you. Um, so, uh, um, if where whereabouts are you based? Oh, sorry, I don't know if we can hear you, but but um, you just approach the primary care education team. And they both have campus based teaching. So if you're interested in sustainability, you might be able to do a little bit of small group facilitation. But um, if you're to prepare to teach at your GP practice and take medical students, everybody will be delighted to, to have you. I'd, I would also add that um, so both sustainable health care um, and quality improvement are in the outcomes for graduates from um, the GMC set in 2018. So medical schools are now obliged to teach quality improvement even places that weren't doing it before and they're also obliged to teach sustainable healthcare so there should be a curriculum lead for each of those areas and it'd be worth approaching find out who they are and approaching them um, thank you and i think florence did you want to say something as well yeah yeah i was just going to add to that that uh, the, the kind of lack of i mean when we started the ssc we didn't have any um well, Anna had a bit of education experience, but actually that the, the universities are often crying out for people to do um, SSCs and, and there's a real, like, it's a really easy way to get into to teaching and um, that, you know, there's the, the kind of other SSCs are on offer. Right? There's such a range of them that, that um, there's a lot of flexibility in that. So some of the, the our students' um, peers were going off and doing two weeks of yoga um, and you know, others are doing kind of physiology and anatomy and so on so um an SSC is a real really good opportunity to just bring your kind of interest and, and passion and um and a, a lot of flexibility in how you teach the students and, and how you assess them at the end of that so SSC is absolutely a very easy way to get Brilliant. Thank you so much uh, to our panel for that question. Now moving uh, just over to the Q&A. We've got a couple of questions on there from Kidal. I think one of them has already been answered. Uh, the thinking about um, how do we actually uh, stress the sustainability component, which is necessary. What's our experience? I'm hoping the panel may have already um, uh, commented on their, their experience and opinion, but there's a supplementary question from Kidal, which I think is interesting on how do we go about continuing to measure long-term uh, sustainability moving forward. Um, so how do we go about measuring sustainability in the longer term? Absolutely crucial. So Francis, you've got your brilliant paper. Do you want to talk a little bit about sustainable value? And uh... Sorry, you're muted still. Thank you, sorry. Um, yeah, I, I, with the sustainability and QI approach, um, one of the main dry, uh, sort of uh, central um, components is really the, me the measurement because um, otherwise you can kind of have projects that sound like a good idea, but it's hard to get them um, supported and sustained in the long term. And also you can sometimes find you've, um, you know, inadvertently increased resource use in another area so it is quite important to measure that I think we've tried to make it quite practical in the context of a QI project and we've produced resources um, I'm sure the susqi.org website is a really good place to go we'll talk a little bit more about it later on but that's where we've put all the resources for people who are doing projects and also people who are trying to teach susqi um, and includes guides to things like how to measure a carbon footprint for your project um, and how and and trying to make that really practical and just think about well what were the what was the um situation beforehand the resource use beforehand and was it after afterwards and how can we attach a carbon figure to that i mean in terms of um continuing that into the longer term i think um what we're doing really in this this project is teaching people the skills for how to go about it and i think there's another 
area of work around organisational commitment and embracing sustainable value as their measure of whether they're doing what they set out to as a healthcare organisation, which I think perhaps we might spend more time on in the next webinar, which is going to be more about embedding into healthcare delivery organisations. Um, but certainly I think that by trying it out in real life projects that they're involved with, I think we can help people to develop those skills that where they get used to using, uh, attaching a carbon figure, for example, and get a carbon footprint. Um, and also thinking about how you capture some of the social impacts because they can be quite diverse and you need to really think about which ones are relevant for your project. Thank you, Francis. Any other comments from panelists? I think this is a question. Really concept about sustaining sustainability, because I've seen that another time where there's some fantastic projects and you know it's all going brilliant, and those people leave because there's such a high turnover. So how do we sustain the sustainability? And and I think what the SASQI really encourages is a way of thinking about systems changing, because a lot of the sustainability work um, still, although I think some of that's changing, where there are you know. Um, dedicated time and it's the same in academia it's done by champions and people are doing it because they're really passionate about it and it's really sufficient to their own time so if it relies on essentially volunteers people get burnt out people move on and the people leave and then the sustainability improvements leave with them and so i think it's really important to get systems changed and to get really strategic buy-in I, I noticed somewhere in the chat i've not kept up with other chats somebody mentioned about green plans like you know what's your hospitals green plan what's the strategic top um, commitment and to be encouraging and fostering that because the nhs in england and i think wales and scotland have equivalents now don't they around national strategies so we need the grassroots champions championing this but we also need some really top down you know we are committed to this and we are going to do it you change the system and then the sustainability stays rather than relying on individual people and volunteer time I think also, um, it's sort of, for, for me, it slightly ties into what you were talking about earlier, um, Heather, around um, really building sustainability into people's idea of what a good doctor is or a good nurse is, and that um, linking it with those concepts of like prevention is the most sustainable form of healthcare, you know, but better healthcare outcomes with fewer resources, and, and really sort of integrating that into every single bit of teaching. So, you know, waking up warm, getting people mobilised earlier, smoking cessation, uh, you know, talking about diet and exercise, etc. All of these things are, are, are things that you can integrate into every single um, bit of teaching. You know, better, better diabetes care is always going to be greener care. You improve your HbA1c, you're not going to get into need, need to progress towards um, renal problems, etc. So. Mm, I would agree. It's that really quite obvious and intuitive link between what we talk about in medicine anyway and in clinical medicine at least anyway in healthcare education and actually pointing out that that aligns very well with the sustainability agenda anyway um thank you so um i've got a couple of uh, excellent questions about the uh, about the education process by itself and lovely question from tom daniels who said could you comment on the pros and cons of two competing models of delivering education on sustainability option one being a dedicated module i.e a lot all focused in one place or option two being about infusing a little bit into everything or at least most educational sessions lovely question who would like to respond first um, can I do these sitting on the fence a bit of both? <laughs> because actually there's value in both. And um, I suppose you could argue both either way. But I think the problem with only having it as an, okay, there's the slot, you know, there's the induction bit, or there's this one module, you know, becomes tokenistic, or it becomes very centralized and just that, rather than, Kay, what you were just mentioning was that, you know, just changing the thinking about, it just creeps into everything that we do, whether you call it sustainability, or I called it good housekeeping, you can call it health promotion, you can call it prevention of care self-care where possible so i think actually both because i think there's value in having dedicated time so that it's really explicit and actually maybe more in-depth aspects but there's also um i think fundamental is, is that it is embedded from the beginning you know from the moment students walk in the door to the moment they graduate continue with postgraduate education um i mean obviously we're biased we're coming here today because we're interested in these things but ultimately if we are going to have really structural and cultural change it's going to take that level of um quite significant change in thinking Lawrence, yeah 
Yeah, I, I'm just going to do the same and, and agree with Heather that you need a bit of both and definitely that integration because if you if it's just a standalone module, which is often where it has been, it's been uh, definitely in medical education somewhere in the kind of global health um, part of the curriculum, which often actually has quite poor attendance, uh, definitely in, in some places I've seen. Then the students who think, OK, well, I'm not into global health. I want to be an orthopaedic surgeon. This isn't me. They switch off. So you need to show them how it is part of all good health care. But then there is still value sometimes in specific skills. And, and you know, again, Saskia shows an example of that, of that specific skill that you need a little bit of dedicated time to, to, to go into and to kind of set that foundation. Mm. Increasingly, um, yeah. It, it, and a lot of that, it may be about kind of teaching faculty and that kind of faculty development of, of showing them how it um, overlaps in their particular area that they're teaching, how this is good healthcare. You know, that example of diabetes, that good diabetes care. Um, is sustainable, um, but that giving them the confidence to, to kind of make those links um, when they're teaching about that. So sort of a balance I'm picking up between sort of chunking, making it easier to get it into the curriculum, building it. So make, uh, what you were saying, Heather, I guess it's around not making, making sure students don't get conflicting messages, that they silo it in, in one bit of teaching and they just say, well, it doesn't apply anywhere else. But actually, uh, there is definitely some benefits to getting it in. Francis, yes. Um, in practice, the, the student selected components have been a bit like a laboratory for sustainable healthcare teaching, and that's and and one of the really important aspects of that is actually the staff development, the faculty development, because um, we know that people know they that it's an important topic. They actually even have to teach it now in medical schools and in and in some of the other courses, including midwifery and so forth, but. Um, they don't necessarily feel confident doing it so I think it can be a really good for faculty development to have um, to develop a, a student select course and to run that with engaged students and to really get you into grips with the the content and then um, it becomes easier to then seed it in and, and spread it to other colleagues I think. Um, I mean in terms of QI teaching in particular um, there are there are a number of places and we've worked with Kings where they have a core module and it's spread over six months and the students, uh, fourth year students have to do a project, a real life project with all the complexities and difficulties and frustrations that that involves. But it does mean they, they actually take some learning into the workplace and into practice. Um, but in a lot of other places at the moment, QI is still taught just really in the theory at undergraduate level. And so um, having a, um, an SSC or like an intensive module does provide more opportunity for people to do at least part of a project and get into a real setting and try things out, which I think is really valuable. Thank you, Francis. Any other comments for that one? Um, there's another excellent educational question from Emma, who I think is probably expressing what we probably are already seeing from kind of barriers that we know exist from QI teaching itself, let alone SUSQI, which is the kind of, how do we make sure that hospitals or, or mentors are open to new ideas that students might identify? Are there concerns that students may feel too junior to challenge bad practice that they see or to be able to actually follow through with a SUSQI project? I would like to address that question. A little bit. So this it was a really important theme and it came up with our um, focus groups with uh, students at, at in Bristol. And there were definitely um, some students that saw themselves as too junior within the team to suggest change or the NHS itself as too big and too sort of rigid as a structure to, to change. And actually, um, it's it's been the, the, the strategies that they found helpful were some strategies that are core to the SUSQI framework, which was sort of co-creating ways forward. Um, so instead of coming in while well, you're doing it all wrong, you need to be doing this, just sitting down with the whole team, the administration, you know, the nurse in charge, the, um, the, uh, you know, the, the, the clinical staff, the patients even, and say, well, what can we do here to, 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 make, to make things better together? And so that, that's been a really helpful way to get over that sort of junior-ness. Um, uh, any other sort of, what was the other part of that question? Sorry, Victoria. Yeah, so thinking about um, mentors or supervisors not necessarily being open to students who have new ideas, maybe about sustainability, if they are potentially supervisors who are new to the idea of, of sustainable healthcare, um, but also to, to, yeah, as we say, students feeling 
too junior to, to um, make changes to, to bad practice. The tips we had from talking to educators about exactly this, it, it, there were the things around um, very small chunks of this tiny video about what is SUSQI. It's a really helpful way to introduce the concept to clinical supervisors. They want something small and chunky and, 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 and not too big for them to get their heads around. And I think once you've got the framework, it just makes so much sense to, you know, the, there's no QI other than SUSQI. But, um, but the other thing we found is, is um, what could trickle up learning. So as students present their projects to, to a, like a clinical team, suddenly everyone can see how this is a really helpful way to be thinking about things. And the next time they supervise a project for their students, you will suddenly find that they're, they're integrating similar concepts, advances, yeah. Did you have your-, your Yeah, way? I will just really simply, I was gonna say um, a lot of, um, uh, well, a lot of times where people are asked to do projects, then the super project supervisors can be quite variable and actually some of them feel quite unconfident in their own knowledge of QI because, the days when I was training, we weren't taught it. And um, so one thing that can be useful is obviously reaching out directly to them. And we have created a video that's especially for supervisors about SUSQI. Um, and um, we've created the, the sort of um, resource pack, step-by-step -step resources and things that they can use as well. Um, but also just going and recruiting supervisors who are on board with sustainability in the first place. So, um, yeah that um reaching out to if they're like if you're if if the university is attached to a trust or more than one trust and those trusts might have green champions in place or just through our connections we might know people and we kind of really encourage those people to step forward and offer themselves as supervisors so that makes it just a bit easier for everyone all around and then you're sort of normalizing it you know any change at some point people can't remember you know maybe 10 years from now we'll look back and say do you remember when this was a new thing and um, and the other thing Kay, i really liked how you said it's so many people are involved and it may be that somebody feels they lack expertise say in procurement or the waste management but actually the susqi project opens up the door to have a conversation with the estates and the procurement leads and the waste management leads and it and um, what i found is that when you do talk to people in other um, departments within the hospital, they're so pleased to have a clinician come and ask them questions and say, well, actually, I'd really love to ask a clinician, you know, X, Y, and Z. And so even if a, maybe a doctor or a nurse or physio um, education supervisor doesn't feel confident, um, but actually that's because maybe some of that knowledge is outside of the particular unit or GP practice or whatever. And um, and the, the whole ethos of sustainability really is multidisciplinary. And, and sometimes I think there's sort of hidden voices, for example, the healthcare assistant, technicians, um, the people that are involved in storage and the porters and, and often aren't included in meetings or in strategic projects and things. And I think sometimes the sustainability where that works really well is because there really is that multidisciplinary from, from all aspects and including patient voices and care voices where possible as well. That's certainly something that we found students commenting on that have done it, that, that everybody is sort of behind a bit of sustainability and, you know, from the chief executive to the hospital porters. And it's a great way of getting people together. Great. Yes. Thank you. Oh, just to say that I was, I've been, we've been interviewing people from, the, I think it's Florence Nightingale School of Nursing, where they've just integrated this across eight different modules, just like that. And they said that the SUSQI resources just work. So just hand them out <laughs> and the supervisors can hand them to their students I just exactly off the shelf resources which we will sure. present we'll show you a little bit later on and um, I'm, I'm conscious of time and I want to wrap up this session with a, a great question from Lisa Durbin um, Lisa it sounds like you should definitely come along to our event on the 9th of June uh, Lisa is working within her trust to integrate sustainability into QI training so looking into integrating it into their uh, silver QI course but also bronze training and potentially gold program, uh, which is fantastic. Um, but she asked a question which I feel is very relevant to education as well, um, which is if you are introducing SUSQI uh, to your students, um, what would be the top three things you would want to get across when first introducing it to people? So if maybe uh, both of our panelists could maybe give us a short word or a short phrase on the top three things they feel they need to get across uh, in SUSQI teaching. He wants to go first. 
go first, although I might be thinking as I go. Um, that's a really good question. I've never had to think like that before. But I guess, um, I mean, the one, the first thing probably that we've mentioned a lot today is that sustainable healthcare is good healthcare. But so lots of this, um, it has real good uh, crossovers between you know, what we should be doing anyway um, and we should be striving for. Um, I guess the second thing that this is a team thing, and, and again, that's kind of come out in some of these, like you won't, you won't achieve anything just on your own. You need to, to, um, to be get to be getting lots of different ideas and and really understanding the system, which means understanding all the people who interact with that system. Um, and I think maybe I'm going to leave it there as two two top things <laughs> that I'd want them to go across. Brilliant. That doesn't come to mind. I, I pass the buck to you thinking, and I've got up to two, so let me see if I can think of a third on the spot as well. So the first thing I think you know resonates similarly um, around um, being feasible. Pick one thing and do it well, and you'll make significant change rather than superficially try to do too many things. Um, so less is more uh, with anything, but particularly quality improvement. Um, and similarly for the second, I think getting your aim right. Very often I find, I was just speaking to students the other day, they were planning their quality improvement essays. And um, they don't have to use the SUSQI. I encourage them to think about it, but those that were, but even if you're not using it explicitly, you know, implicitly, it's gonna be in any quality improvement project. But very often there's a jump to the interventions. You know, my goal is to introduce a checklist. My goal is to um, teach nurses blank. And very often I say, that's the intervention. What's the actual goal? Because if you don't know what your goal is, how do you measure that? And some of the comments around measuring. And so it's getting that aim right. Similarly with research projects, there's lots of overlap with research. Um, and so I think if you've got your question right, your QA question right, that leads you to a really specific, measurable, you know, that kind of smart principles goal, then your interventions follow, um, but you're clear on what you're trying to achieve. And therefore it's easier when you're trying to explain that to other people and, and later on measuring it. Um, maybe my third one will be about research. Um, and this is my academic hat on, there's such a lack of research in many areas, but particularly I saw somebody said they were a neonatologist. So I'll share some green ICU links. And for my own personal um, bias in the intensive care community, there's a number of us that are trying to increase the, the research evidence base. But drawing from the SUSQI framework around this ethos of how sustainable um, quality improvement um, practices and that sort of gray boundary between where quality improvement and research overlap and, um, and there's just much more need for it to continue that. So. Thank you so much to our panelists. Um, I would love to hear from everyone, but just looking at the time, um, I think we'll wrap up this session there, if that's okay. Thank you so much for all your wonderful questions. Um, it was even quite difficult to keep up with the chat because there's so much networking going on and lots of people reaching out to ourselves and to each other. Um, so we will be sharing contact details and details about our networks and things later on in the session. So do get in touch. And thank you again, everyone, for this wonderful questions and apologies for the questions we couldn't get to, but hopefully we'll be able able to cover them in the next uh, event. So now we're going to move on to a, uh, a section where we'd like to share some learning with you of some research that we've done um, uh, in the Saskatchewan Education Project on a paper that was published, I think last week, potentially the week before, <laughs> uh, in Medical Teacher, all funding um, the evaluation of, of, of SUSQI teaching uh, uh, in multiple centres. So as I said, we're going to do some learning from what we learned from our SUSQI education project. Um, as you can see, we've got a number of publications that have come out from uh, the work of, of, of SUSQI education at CSH, um, multiple papers which have looked at um, uh, SUSQI in practice and indeed the concepts around particularly challenges and strategies for translating um, SUSQI its practice within healthcare education. This presentation we're going to look at this first paper, which was, as I said, just published last week in Medical Teacher um, around evaluating sustainability and quality improvement uh, across um, uh, healthcare education settings in multiple um, sites. So um, this was a paper that was written by our uh, fellow Rosanna Spooner, uh, myself, uh, Siobhan Parsa-Williams, who, who's our Susquehanna Education Lead, Francis Mortimer, and um, uh, supervised by uh, Kay Leedham Green who's on the call. Uh, so what do we aim to do in this project? So we, our overarching aim was to describe, analyze and explore the application of the SUSQI approach in healthcare education, and more specifically to evaluate the impact of the SUSQI toolkit, which we will uh, present to you later on, um, on how well students meet firstly the intended learning outcomes of the toolkit, of the SUSQI toolkit. Secondly, how student motivation for sustainable clinical practice relates to their intention to 
apply the SUSQI learning that they receive. And then thirdly, the educational value of actually learning SUSQI. So what did we do? So this was a mixed method study design and there were seven live online teaching sessions uh, which took place between September and March 2021 that consisted of sending some pre-reading about sustainable healthcare, sustainability, why this is important and an introduction to the SUSQI framework, followed by some live, uh, live workshops with an opening lecture and, in, and then followed by interactive breakout sessions to really explore the tools um, uh, that are included within the SUSQI toolkit. The sessions were then followed by a post-session anonymous Qualtrics survey uh, given out to participants. Um, and for this, we received a mean response rate of 72%. Um, so the survey was designed based on theories of academic motivation and educational value. And as you can see from the table here, we had a total of 177 participants, mostly female, mostly of white ethnicity and the highest participation coming from the East of England um, uh, Foundation School. Yes. So basically it showed that students were sort of very highly motivated and, and we did a sort of analysis of comparison across these and actually unsurprisingly the students that, that, that found social justice and environmental protection as important parts of their personal lives, most students do, you can see how skewed that is to the right, um, also valued uh, this teaching. Um, they and it would tend to be internal motivation, not external motivation. So these are quite intrinsic values. And by thereby, by integrating this into their professional practice, they're kind of squaring that whole, bring, bringing um, their personal values into their workplace values. So that this, this is actually really helpful for people. You know, it avoids moral injury and all those sorts of things. Um, and uh, yeah, so we had, I understand how to deliver sustainable value. So um, yeah, so the, and, and the, the, this is the variation ac across professions. And you can see that, um, that, that the nurses and the postgraduate doctors had significantly higher agency, perhaps compared to undergraduate medical students, which is perhaps why Florence's um, project for getting the undergraduates to perhaps propose projects and or to, or to work with people who, uh, who are prepared to facilitate a student project is helpful and actually the postgraduate doctors and nurses have a greater agency in the workplace unsurprisingly. So we found obviously they found it very useful this this is the kind of the immediate value they found it useful it was refreshing um, it was it was um, it, as I said, it resonated with their intrinsic um, values they they not everyone necessarily developed uh, went to do SASQI projects but they often developed what we call almost like a lens on their day-to-day -day practice. So it had wider impacts. You can't stop seeing it once you've, once you've learned it. Um, so this, this, this helped them on a day-to-day -day basis, not necessarily in sort of um, discrete projects. So, uh, and it also helped a little bit of well-being. Some people feel quite sort of overwhelmed by this thing that's happening, the climate crisis, and actually finding concrete ways within their day-to-day -day practice that they can make a difference not just cycling to work but actually having quite huge impacts once you quantify the the impacts that you can have if you change a system and um, they, they can actually do quite a lot for students to make them feel quite good about what they do and are more hopeful about the future thank you yeah so our our, our limitations obviously we, it, it wasn't um uh, fully multi-professional and um, obviously positive sampling bias, although 72% completing educational evaluation is actually particularly high. Um, and obviously this is a, a contextualized thing at, at the places that we did it. So our findings won't necessarily be transferable um, to other contexts. And uh, what did we con conclude? So um, I think my main, the main things I found, I, I don't think I've ever seen a more highly motivated group of students wanting to do this. So um, it's an open door. You don't need to work on their motivation. Um, you do need to work on their, their skills. So a lot of them have start off with almost no skills in QI. Um, so do, do take time to support them in developing those skills. Um, do create opportunities for them in practice and be mindful that, that um, junior students may lack agency in the workplace. Um, and you know, even if they don't do a project, your students will be developing what we call sort of a sustainability lens as they, they walk around and see, see things in a certain way. And that, that can be useful throughout their future careers. Brilliant. Thank you so much for stepping in there, Kate. So um, there's an opportunity to ask questions. Actually, I'll, I'll stop the, um, the sharing. 
Got so the Q and A about how do we um, oh. assess the impact of teaching. So we're very happy to share the um, the survey, the Quattrix survey that we use to assess the impact of that teaching. And I think it might even be on the SUSQI website. Is it Victoria? Not not yet. But um, if you look at the, the there was a really nice. Um, way of, of evaluating the impact of teaching in the Bright, the Bristol project as well. Um, so they, they developed their own question. Ours, ours was slightly based on that as well, wasn't it, Victoria? Um, and it, but we, we, we've got another framework for actually looking at the projects themselves to see what impact on sustainability the QI projects have had, which is another way of doing it. And we've just ticked off whether the, whether the projects address one of those five drivers of higher quality care with lower environmental impact. And that's for, through Francis Drive, a diagram of prevention, you know, patient education, um, lean swaps, lean processes, or low carbon swaps, et cetera. And then um, just looking at the, the measures, did it create healthcare value? And what were the environmental, social, and economic impacts? Um, yeah, so, um... I, I'd like to, I, I can see question from um, Sherry about beacon sites and things like that. And um, I'd really like to let people know a little bit about um, what the opportunities are for that. Um, and what we've done in the third um, objective of the project, which is to share um, how we how we support spread. Um, now, I was going to share what I was actually thinking is um, I've got a couple of slides, but what I'd like to do first of all, just very briefly, just to show people the susqi.org website, because there's a huge, there's a huge amount of resources. And if there's one thing, one thing that you noted down from today, that's probably going to be most useful to you, it probably be this website. Um, and just to show you that um, it's, it's got, it's two main sections. The first one is around doing a project and it's got this step-by-step -step guide with lots of, templates and tools and downloads to support you at the different steps and the four steps are the ones that I mentioned earlier on about setting goals studying the system designing improvement and measuring impact so there's lots of very practical things for people who are doing a project or if you're supporting someone else who's doing a project and the second major sector section is um, the uh, educator pack and um, within that um, we mentioned earlier there's a video and some um, guidance for people who are supervising a QI project and then there's also the educator um, the pack which includes templates um, learning activities and sessions that you could run with your students and they're designed to be done online but they can also be done face to face um, and it is free to access and it's open to anyone but there is a um, uh, you, you need to request by putting in your email and then we'll send it to you and that's just part of our monitoring for um, how far the, uh, the resources are reaching um, and then there are some case studies as well on the site so do look up that um, and find um, anything that's useful to you um, and then I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the Beacon Site Programme um, Uh, so, just going back to expand a little on the spread um, resources we've done. So, uh, I've just mentioned the susqi.org step-by-step guide, um, but as part of the project we've um, developed some other resources as well. So, in the chat there's been shared a link to um, a 30-minute e-learning session, which is on e-learning for healthcare, which is the kind of NHS platform um, for that's open to all NHS staff and it's free in England anyway, um, and I think beyond. So it's worth going to, to that. Um, and then the other thing we have developed is our three-part SUSQI course, which is one of um, the CSH courses. So we run courses on quite a number of topics through CSH and it, they comprise a, a kind of online self-study element of four to six hours where you work through the, the course materials and that's where a lot of the information didactic bit happens um, and then there's a course workshop which is a half day with lots of opportunity to ask questions meet other people who are using the the approaches and also to test out 
tools um, and techniques that we've been learning. And then um, there's a, a third part where you can drop in and um, bring a project or an initiative you're working on and, and share that with people and get some, in, some input. So um, in this list, you'll see somewhere that there is um, the sustainability in quality improvement and there's also teaching SASQI um, course, which is particularly for educators. Um, so the other thing that we're doing to support spread is giving recognition to beacon sites. So beacon sites are um, organisations and they could be either um, an, uh, a university or another academic institution, or it could be a, a healthcare delivery organisation that teaches QI to staff, for example, um, and they can uh, register as a beacon site and get recognition for the, um, the work they're doing to embed sustainability into the teaching that they provide to students or staff. Um, and this is a, a new thing. So we were originally working with pilots or beacon sites through the program, which was uh, the way that we um, developed those, um, that experience of teaching real people and um, developing the tools to support that and then doing the evaluation, which Victoria and Kay had just presented. Um, but we're now opening it that up so that any organisation that's committed to embedding into sustain in, into their QI teaching or practice can um, register with us and, and show evidence that you're doing that. And then you can be displayed on the map and included within that network of organisations and, and we can be running annual sharing events as well. Um, and the resources that I showed you before and listed, you know, were all are all available to individuals, but we also um, are in, able to support organisations that are doing this. Um, and so one example would be through block booking places on the courses for staff or for faculty, for example. Um, also, um, we run a Green Ward competition, which uh, Rachel, our colleague who's on the call today, is the uh, programme lead for the Green Ward competition, and that runs in hospitals <coughs> and other um, healthcare organisations, and that works with teams using the SASQI approach to develop projects and um, bring it all together in a competition awards um, ceremony and lots of positive communications about their projects and the impacts of their projects. And that's really great for getting um, some sort of mentoring directly to teams. And, and you can, by including the QI teams and QI educators in that, then they can get experience of co-mentoring um, project teams. But that's more um, uh, suitable for healthcare delivery organisations. And we'll be talking more about that and uh, in our next webinar. Um, but one thing that is, um, and similarly, we support, we provide educational support and mentoring to fellows and scholars, which are, who are in, um, who could be in a wide range of different organisations. And so we, we're happy to do that and we have a programme for doing that. Um, but the new thing that we are, um, we've created to take forward the kind of mentoring and ongoing support that we've been providing to our beacon sites is this SASQI Academy. And what that is, is, um, intended for leads who are embedding SASQI into their organisation, whether that be a healthcare delivery organisation or a university or another academic one. Um, and it, it's a sort of bundle with um, the relevant access to the relevant courses, it's, um, also access to quarterly forums and sharing events, and uh, access to new educator, education materials as they're developed. And um, and really this um, sort of flexible mentoring and, and support that we've been able to give through the SASQI education project to those pilot sites. But this was a way of being able to give it to, um, to hopefully lots more sites. So a certain number of hours of um, support. So that's really worth looking up if you're um, leading this within your organisation or if you're an organisation that wants to support certain staff to lead it and embed it. Um, and all of that can be found on our website at um, sustainablehealthcare.org.uk slash SASQI. So I can't see my clock, but I think we've got 30 seconds. I think um, 
I, I'd just like to say thank you very, very much to everyone who's attended today and also to our fantastic team. As you can see everybody is really knowledgeable and really inspiring and inspired by this approach, which is, I think is just really, we've really found it fantastic to be able to equip people with skills and confidence to actually make change in practice um, and the, the QI when done well is a really great way to, to facilitate that. So thank you very much.